coming to the end of the month, almost the end of the year. So I believe that we have witnessed not just our practice, but everyone's practice as well, and especially the retreat that we had recently. So I do have a question actually, but I see that only three or four of you have decided to check in. So anyways, We'll talk a bit about practice today, uh, on spiritual practice. Mm. Uh, it's been mentioned a lot of times that when we practice mindfulness, you know, it's not just seen as a means to an end, whereby we only practice when we have something going on in our lives. And it's also not a leisure activity whereby you practice only when you have free time. Mm. Over the course of this year, I understand that this year might have been very tough for many people, whether at work or your personal life, or even maybe your health issues, right? The question is, why are we uh, practicing? It's safe to say that you're practicing because you have some stress, you want to have some clarity, you want to have some focus, you want to identify suffering, you want to transform yourself, so and so and so and so, right? But that is just scratching on the surface. Or maybe you are thinking that you're not practicing because you're just, you practiced too much last year. And then this year, you decide to practice less, right? So practice is not seen in terms of the, I would say it's not, it goes beyond the quality or and quantity of your practice. Right? It's about why you're alive. Why are you breathing? The late Venerable Ajahn Chah has mentioned that if you have time to breathe, you have time to practice. Right? The meditation masters have also stated that when you are very busy, you practice more. You increase the time that you practice. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean sitting on your meditation cushion every day for extended periods of time? Or does it mean being more mindful and attuned to your thoughts and feelings? See, being attuned to your thoughts and feelings doesn't mean you're inclining towards them, but to hear them deeper, hear them clearer. We're all familiar with our Lukiteshwara or Guaning, who is known as the sound perceiver to practice deep, compassionate listening with the purpose of understanding. So how much are we listening to ourselves? How much are we listening to the things that we say, the text that we send? How much are we listening to the voice within us? There's two voices within all of us. One that tries to keep you in your path or what we call the, the angel voice. And then we have the devil voice as well that tries to push you away. But then how do we determine whether or which is which? The one that says yes to everything, is that the true voice? Or is that the self-deprecating voice that wants to be validated by saying yes to everything, not knowing how to say no? How about times when we decide to say no to things? Is that the ego saying? Or is that our suffering crying out for help? Mm -hmm. So how deep we go in life, how we flourish in our practice depends on how much we listen, how attuned we are towards our thoughts and our feelings. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that when you freak out and act on your fears and your suffering, it means you're uh, attuned to it. No, it's not that, right? So many people can find excuses not to be aligned with themselves, not to return home to themselves, because it's so much easier to run away from what seems real, what seems true, and sometimes even running away from pain and even sadness. And some people shun the light like the hungry ghost. When they see light, they see some positivity in life, they shun, they are afraid of it. They can't answer why. Yeah. So the question is, what are we truly avoiding in life? Yeah. Sometimes it's not just about avoiding suffering. Sometimes we avoid the chance of a deep, profound spiritual experience. We avoid enlightenment. We avoid the path of the Buddha when it's right in front of us. You may have worked very hard for it, that's why you're still in the session. That's why you're reading books. That's why you're contemplating about life, trying to understand things, trying to understand people, trying to build and foster good relationships. But why do we as human beings tend to distract ourselves with things? 
Why is it when we feel certain emotions or something bad happens in life, we decide to turn a blind eye to it and run into our comfort zones? So as practitioners, for like a few months, for some of you and years, for some of you, right? what are you really doing? Are you seeing a difference, a, separate, uh, a separation between the spiritual life and your everyday life? Are you seeing them as something that flows together? Are you seeing them as one? So the practice of gratitude is something that we emphasize on a lot that when you practice gratitude, we have contentment in life, and then desires uh, or unwholesome desires cannot come about because you know you have enough. That's what contentment is about, to know that you have enough. And that is not also, that is also not to say that, oh, I have studied enough, I have meditated enough, and I don't need to meditate anymore. So I've noticed that uh, there are people who can practice very powerfully for months and then they stop practicing for six months and then they start from zero again right so why do we do that what is practice to you exactly why are you trying to get out of life so as much as you say that we should not have a goal when it comes to the dharma or spiritual practice we want to know that the goal or the end point begins here the path is the goal, to arrive with each breath, constantly into this ever-new, ever-changing, impermanent nature of the present moment, of the here and now. To arrive and to reawaken, to say. You may think that you have some kind of epiphany in the past or some kind of awakening, a glimpse of enlightenment. But we also know that those moments are transient to the subject to pass right when you think about any profound wisdom or satori that you have experienced before it is just a perception even if you are if you were able to meditate into the jhanas or the absorption it is the past really if you think about it and then to try to recreate that moment is chasing after the future you're not truly present anymore so if you cannot recall the most blissful moments that we have in, be it in life or in meditation, it comes with a lot of openness, a lot of letting go, a lot of acknowledging of life and the universe as a whole. That's why we feel a sense of liberation. We can be completely at ease, can embrace whatever happens, and we have the sense of curiosity to see things anew. And in Zen, we call that the beginner's mind. Even in MBSR, the beginner's mind is always emphasized. To have the beginner's mind can help us a lot, not just to understand our practice, but to understand ourselves and the world in which we live. Because everything is constantly changing. The whole point of practice is to find yourself. And I don't mean go inward or go out to the mountains to find yourself. Now, that is a retreat. Finding yourself means recognizing yourself in the present moment. How far you've come. Who are you today? How are you right in this moment? How has the world changed because you change? How have you transformed because the world around you is transforming alongside you? You see, when we talk about emptiness, we talk about non-self means that when you look deeply into yourself, you can find nothing else. I mean, you can find every, sorry, when you look deeply into yourself, you can find everything else besides yourself. Which is to say that everything is capable of awakening us. Be it a distraction. And let's say when you meditate in a temple, you hear the sound of someone snoring, or perhaps one of the guys will just fall all of a sudden and create a commotion. <laughs> or the sound of the passing train. Or maybe at home, where you are now, you might have some noise coming from the outside later. Mm -hmm. 
how do we use this to, to our benefit? How do we use this to understand ourselves? Mm. It's always stressed that we use sound as a mindfulness spell. And so what is mindfulness? Mm. So that is up to you to answer. What is mindfulness? How do you use it? How do you use everything as a mindfulness bell? What does it mean by everything is a mindfulness bell? To wake us up again into this moment. So it's the same thing with problems in life. Do you see it as an opportunity for you to understand yourself? The very funny thing is that when it comes to work, when it comes to the business work, we know that every problem can give us a solution, make us better, can even help the business to grow. And human beings are so good at creating such systems and we know how to work with those systems in the working world. But when it comes to ourselves, we totally completely forget about how we should be. The problems are, there's no bad problems in life. And if there's no bad problems in life, then it's not a problem anymore. Because we can use them. So when something undesirable happens to us, is the most wondrous opportunity for us to wake up. Because that means that the world has shaken. You have shaken. Things that you grasp onto that seem so real, seem so solid and so independent, start to crumble. And if you are willing to let it crumble and know that it's part and parcel of life, that because you can't cling on to anything, then you will be able to find meaning. Some people look for the best practice center. They look for the best guru. They look for the best partner. They look for the best employment. Or they look for the best place of dwelling where they can be, where they feel that the environment can nourish them. That is good if you're looking for a nourishing environment that can be supportive of what you want to achieve in your limited human lifespan. Even better if you are looking for a place that can help you to practice. That is very good. But all these things, these environments, they are aids, they are supports. No, they're not the ultimate goal. They don't lead you to enlightenment. They don't lead you to success. They just remove obstacles for you, make it more pleasant, make it more conducive for you to achieve what you want to achieve. So we have to be very mindful of this then we were looking for the so-called best external circumstances, that is not the end goal. That's actually still just a means to an end. But your mentality when it comes to life, your mindset, when you find the right, adopt the right mindset, you won't, you will stop seeing things as a means to an end because the goal and the path are not separate. We arrive in each moment. Seasons change. Political climates change. Your bank accounts are changing every moment as well. Right? So why do we cling into our comfort zones? Why do we tend to depend our happiness and our peace, our stability, our sense of belonging on such external circumstances? So be mindful that all these things are just support. Uh, supporting aids that create more conducive more pleasant and more convenient environment for you to practice and for you to live a happy life. But if we cling on to these external circumstances as though that's the end goal or that's where our happiness lies, that is very, very dangerous. All it takes in the last two years was for a little virus, a tiny thing that we can't even see called COVID to shake up the entire world. Oh, there's lockdown here. I'm unhappy. I'm leaving. Oh, there's restrictions here. I need to wear a mask. I'm leaving. Oh, I need to be vaccinated. I hit this thing. Blah, 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 blah. Right? And then people start to move around. It's the same thing. Right? 
COVID or no COVID. And some people try to find a place where they think that they will be most useful. Because, you see, that's another part of the ego. So what I talked about just now was the kind of ego that thinks that you are not good enough. That's why you need to rely on external circumstances. You know, the self-deprecating kind of ego. Not good enough, not confident enough. Oh, be humble. I need to remain humble. Can't be arrogant, can't be proud. No, that's another form of pride, another form of ego. But then there's the arrogant kind of ego that thinks that I need to find a place that aligns with my values, with my vision of what I want to achieve. Mm. Mm, I've seen you know, this kind of mentality. We get nowhere as well. Thinking that we have a big purpose, that we need to go to a place where we can flourish with our big purpose. Because certain places is not worthy of us. Other places are more worthy of, of us. That is another trapping of the ego, that we balloon ourselves up. You see, when we think this way, that we need to find a place where we can truly be ourselves, where things can align, it means that you're rejecting the present moment. If you have such a big purpose and great power within yourself, great wisdom, open heart, open mind, then why can't you be open in this moment, in your current job, in your current working culture, in your current environment? Why? If you're such, if you're so powerful and strong and so ascended in a way, then why do we see others as being beneath us? How can we be affected by people who are below us if you are really so powerful? If you look at the statue of the Buddha or any saints, any gods, any deities that look peaceful, looks beautiful, wherever you throw them, you put them in, in a cave, for example, and an abandoned cave. Maybe 500 years later, someone discovered it. It still looks serene and beautiful. Right? Such a great being doesn't care whether his or her statue or image is being worshipped or venerated or mistreated. It is still beautiful over there, as long as it's not disfigured, of course. And when we discover such images, we treat them as sacred treasures or relics or even antiques. Mm. But then when someone doesn't value us in life or we feel unappreciated for just a brief moment, how can we lose our sacredness all of a sudden so quickly? So when we venerate the Buddha, it's a reflection of ourselves. And praying or chanting is to change the person who is praying, to change the person who is chanting that we can resonate with that sense of holiness, purity, sacredness to reflect into us, to remind ourselves that we are on this path, to remind ourselves that we have this awakening nature within us, that the Buddha is, was a human being, like all of us, who can remain equanimous and to use the environment to his benefit, at the same time benefiting the environment everywhere he goes. So that's the difference between leading a spiritual life and a worldly life. It's not to say that everyone needs to become monks and nuns or live in monasteries. Because the fact is, we are still living in a city. You know, only my head is shaved over here. <laughs> I'm not a monk anyways. But then... How are we making full use of our limited time on earth? Are we subjecting ourselves to the conditioning of the world or to changes? So the question that I feel all of us can ask ourselves is how am I learning to be in each changing moment? Or if you have addiction issues, how do you learn to be with the addiction? 
to be means not to write on it, not to follow it, but to observe it, to recognize it, allow it to arise, whether it's an addiction, pleasant feeling or unpleasant feeling, good situations, undesirable situations. How do we learn to be with them without jumping too quickly to try to resolve it or to try to escape from it? So that's how we can meet ourselves. When we learn how to meet ourselves in such a way, to be truly honest with ourselves, not try to fix or try to give ourselves advice. That's where we can come back home to ourselves. And that's where others will be able to see you and begin to understand you. Because you will be vibrating from your brightest light. Simply because you offered yourself that light first. So as we continue into meditation, take this opportunity you just use your own light of mindfulness to shine to yourself. Looking beyond this limited time on earth, of how many lifetimes have you come back? How many cycles of existence have we lived through? Not just in the entire mind stream, but in this very life. How many times have we trapped ourselves in repetitive patterns? Just notice how alive your body is, getting in touch with all your cells, your skin, your muscles, your joints. Perhaps you can even feel your heartbeat. Look at your body as though it's your very first time observing your body. Whether it's weak or strong, sick or healthy, it is alive. body is doing its best to sustain itself. So pay close attention to your body, to every part of your body.
body has been changing ever since the time you were resting in your mother's womb. This is how the body has kept itself alive, despite the fact that it will stop functioning one day. Having lived decades How far have we actually come spiritually? How much have we truly lived? Maybe there were phases in your life where you went through profound transformation or profound suffering and happiness. But are those moments still with you? Or are they simply building blocks leading to this moment? And how much have we been leveraging of them? Or have we completely forgotten about them? Just keep observing and paying close attention to your body. Knowing that this body is subject to old age and sickness, with birth comes death. And every time we spin cycles in our brains or our minds, we affect the body in a negative manner, whereby the breath shortens. Causing tension into the various parts of the body. You can go on to reflect on those who have lost their bodies, people who have passed away, or spirits that do not have a body at all to cultivate.
some of us do everything we can to preserve our health and our bodies. But upon achieving these health goals, we still torture the body when we feel emotional. So what are we really using this human life for? Doing so much to keep it beautiful, strong and healthy, but yet falling to the traps of the ego or the immaturity that the mind can create sometimes. Letting go of your awareness of the body. Just dwell and delve into the domains of the mind. Listen to the thoughts, but don't follow them. And listen to the silence without attaching to it. Simply turn the mind inward and observe the mind. Is the mind restless and tired from repetitive patterns? Is it feeling dull or is it bright? Being aware that you're alive. How can you stabilize your mind in this moment? If there's suffering or residual emotional energies, are you rejecting them? Are you trying to change them? Are you simply allowing them to rise, to fabricate some thoughts, and to dissolve eventually without disturbing the process? Remember, you can use every physical and mental phenomena to wake your mind up.
Just be the knowing. And there's something to be known. The knower appears. And that process is called knowing. And when there's nothing to be known, there is no need for the knower to be present. And there's nothing to labor that non-process. Notice whether the mind is reactive or is it perceiving. Is the mind stirring itself by flirting with perceptions and feelings? Or is it simply being present Gently adjust your lips so that it is relaxed. Reposition your tongue so that it's touching your palate, so that your breath is smooth. And readjust your gaze to gaze into the back of your eyelids.
making subtle changes to balance the mind. Using the body and mind and the environment as your support for your cultivation. Maintaining stability in each changing moment. Becoming aware of how the mind might waver and how you can learn to stabilize it without trying to create any wonderful moments or experience. But just be in this moment. To stabilize the mind doesn't mean that you shut off all thoughts, but it's how you can remain calm to thoughts. How you can remain calm and peaceful towards every kind of happening without trying to solve things, to derive solutions, or to make sense of things, but simply to co-live and coexist with things without stirring them, disturbing the processes, or intervening. Mm 
If you notice the ego being bored or having aversion, how do you live with it and stabilize the mind? Become aware that this is a practice of purification. Do not subject oneself into the klesas or the defilements. Do not succumb to usual habitual patterns or karmic patterns that pushes or pulls us out of the center. So stabilizing the mind in each passing and changing moment is in itself an act of purification of the mind. And loosening the defilement's grip onto us. To allow mental karmic processes to pass and to weaken.
reflecting light into yourself. Noticing how you have been using this precious human life, this precious human rebirth. Also being aware that we never know when this body will shut down. Now you still have this wondrous opportunity to cultivate. But you might not have the chance anymore in future. Looking beyond this lifetime, are you even able to determine what your next rebirth will be? <laughs> are you able to determine who you become, which family you'll be born in, or if you will even become human again in your next life. If your answer is it depends, or well, you can't answer, you can't give a specific answer or a detailed answer, it means it is extremely dangerous. For any kind of karma can ripen at the moment of your death. And the current trajectory that you're on is also undecided. Are you living a life of purification? Or are you stirring your karmic energies, fanning the flames of your karmic energies to keep them alive? Well, if the answer is it doesn't matter where you end up in your next life, then why are you concerned about tomorrow or next year or about where to move to or what to say in your next meeting? Or even where to go this weekend? So turn your mind inward, deeper, into all your thought processes, all kinds of mental activities that you're used to riding on, used to using. Some of them are based on Dharma or understanding. Some of them are worldly. And deep down, you know what leads you to ruin and what leads you to liberation and happiness. For letting go is peace. So with a felt sense of a white light, allow that light to flash through the sense of being into every part of your body.
into every cell. For every cell can trigger a sense of self, a sense of ego. For if we use our cells and every part of our skin, every organ to interact with the world. That's how we become reborn in each moment, based on a single sensation. Or in the authentic Vipassana tradition, we call it the Kalapa. A kind of atom with data encoded into it, corresponding to a time in space. They trigger the sense of self and we act on them, creating karma. So visualize white light passing through your body, penetrating into every cell, every kalapa, every minute kalapa. flowing into every karmic thought processes, the kind of sankharas, the kind of mental formations and mental activities that you use to operate on. Let the light of understanding, of letting go of wisdom flow into them. Whatever pushes you out of your center or drags you outside of your sense of being. See if you're inspired to let them go, to release them, to release their grip on you so they can focus on your true sense of well-being in each and every moment. How many lifetimes have you played with your mental processes resulting in suffering, resulting in unhappiness, resulting in an endless search for happiness outside and not within? And what kind of new resolution will you embody? Not to make, but to embody. So that you can live a life that's pure and far away from your own mental afflictions and defilements. So you can keep them at bay and watch them arise and fall away without being caught up in them. So white light flashing through endlessly, purifying, restoring, cleansing. Ha 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 ho ba
liquid light penetrating the times when you were amplifying your ego or falling victim into your ego times when you were even preserving your ego purifying all those moments especially times when you are simply polishing your ego effects that the ego have produced not just in your life but in the lives of others the arguments the pain the conflicts even times when you have never spoken out for the truth from your own true inner voice and because you did not communicate you've wasted people's time times when you have rejected your own awakening nature let everything surface and be purified by the white light of vajra sattva Allow Vajra Sattva to take hold of you, sitting above your crown in his pure radiant white light, white liquid light that flows out of his heart. Purifying you. Calming down all mental afflictions. Every five, six elements in each cell and each atom. Every five aggregate that exists within each part of the skin. Allow them to take the right rebirth. So that you can begin anew. 
begin a new, a new kind of light. There's just light, nothing else. Openness, purification, being. Letting go of everything. Restoring your presence. Stabilizing the mind. If you have great aspirations, spiritual aspirations, worldly aspirations, 
think that you are good. Think that you're worthy of a better opportunity. Think that you're worthy of your own position. And you ought to be a leader in your own life. And what is a leader or a great person who can't stabilize the mind? What sort of better or smarter person you are if you can't even stabilize the mind? Unless you are sick in this session, don't move your body for the next 10 minutes. See how the mind reacts and whether you can stabilize the mind. Only for those with physical disabilities or those who are sick, you can move. But those who are healthy, freeze the body but let it be relaxed and don't move for the next 10 minutes. If you find yourself developing aversion or reactivity or guilt towards the things I just said, then notice how your mind has just been stirred, falling into karmic patterns again. If you feel bad about it now, then remember, you can always let go let it pass. Be calm towards it. Not to find calm, but just be calm towards it. And the mind will be bright and stabilized on its own.
三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度三度
ハッピーゲームアカクサタガナタパカサンディケナショトフンカンバカシティナラカサタイトロゴソトウンネカンマカンニダンニタソンディトウソンディトソンディトサンドサンドサンドサンドサンドサンドサンドサンドサンドサン
to all gods, all spirits, all deities, Dharma protectors, earth devas, hell beings, animals, plants and minerals, those who are born and those who have yet to be born, and those in their bardo intermediate states. So that with our merits, they can attain happiness. With our merits, they can liberate their minds from suffering and defilements. So they can let go and move on after obtaining peace. Himina Vanya Kamina Vajaya Kunutara Chari Upakara Chamata Pita Jayataka Piyama Mangsuryo Chani Maharaja Kuna Wandana Rapicha Brahma Maharaja Inda Chatu Luka Palaja Devada Yamomita Manu Saja Majata Viri Kapija Sabi Sata Suki Hundu Vanyani Kap Kati Min Sukan Chati Vidandi Nuki Pang Pabi Tavu Madang Imina Vanya Kamina Imina Udi Sina Jaki Pahang Sulapi Chiwatanu Badana Chaitana Yesandani Hinada Mayawani Banatu Mamana Santu Sabata Yawayata Jato Pawe Pawe Uchuchitan Satipanya San Nikuria Mina Mara Lapandu Noga Sankandun Chavri Sumi Putati Pawara Nato Tamunato Varu Tamunato Pachika Putoja Sankunato Daruma Mangde Soda Manu Pawe Namaru Kasang Lapanduma Panjamare Chiri Nato Pato Samputi Muta Manjato Sajambakasi Sima Hawi Rang Sabaputi Nama Mihang Ete Nasape Mara Palayandu Itang Noe Renang Hodus Kata Huntu Yatayo Itang Noe Renang Hodus Kata Huntu Yatayo Itang Noe Renang Hodus Kata Huntu Yatayo Sabesada vera hundu apia paja hundu aniga hundu sukiatan apia harantu Kadang banyang balang mai hang sapi baki pawan tu te We offer tribute of our practice to all beings To our parents, our ancestors, our teachers, the Buddha And to all beings on earth Namo Sikata We don't have time for sharing. So, questions. So, today was a very different meditation than I feel like we usually have in Spirit Circle. Um, I guess it was effective in that I did have a lot of thoughts come up triggered by your guidance. Um, and then some of the thoughts, I realized it had to do with my own ego where my preference would have been 
I think, okay, so then my judgments of what was going on was that I felt that today was particularly lecture-y. Um, I feel like it didn't feel like it came from a place of compassion, but then it was kind of more of a, the tough love approach where you're trying to force our minds into certain states, um, but then those states are also triggered by your guidance. So then I felt like it was kind of a push pull where it's it was it was an odd experience for me. Um, and then I felt that they're also usually compared to normal sessions, I feel like there's more time and space to sit with the guidance for a bit. So then that space can open up within ourselves. Um, but when there were constant triggers in the external environment by many words, when I, when I personally preferred fewer words would have been more effective, then all of this came up within me um, because I think that, you know, as spiritually um, attuned as I feel that I am sometimes, then sometimes the ways in which the ego can present itself um, is in this spiritual superiority. So where I think that, you know, like these types of rules or thoughts or emotions don't apply to me um, when they were triggered today. So then I thought that in terms of purification, it was effective because it's only when you're aware of that within yourself and how it's brought to the surface um, when others reflect it back to you that you can really work or that I can really work on purifying that within myself. So thank you. So, okay, it's getting late. Apologize for it. So, yes, I'll see you all soon. Take care.